We have been going through Paul's letter to the Galatians. And uh, this morning we'll be in chapter 5. There are six chapters in Galatians. I'm going to uh, kind of use chapter 5 to conclude for now uh, Galatians. Uh, and um, want to begin by uh, going back to some ancient history and give an give a, uh, incident from ancient history uh, from the year 2000. For some of you, that is ancient history. Um, want to go back to a time when tech stocks were really hot. In fact, in March of 2000, the technology uh, heavy NASDAQ exchange, and those of you who are into investing know what I'm talking about. The NASDAQ Composite Index peaked at more than 5,000 points. It had more than doubled its value in just a year. But just a few days later, the dot-com bubble burst, and it became a dot-com bomb as it became to turn came to be termed. The uh, index plunged, by, and by October of 2000, the index had plunged more than 75%. And those of us who had dreamed of freedom 55 recalculated. Five trillion dollars, a little more than the farmers make in market value, was wiped out as plummeting stocks brought all these soaring tech prices down to earth with a thump. And suddenly, there was an epidemic of high-salaried, young up-and-comers who were out of work. And instead of uh, dozens of burgeoning corporations who were uh, competing for their technical expertise and their internet know-how, know-how, these dot-bombed employees were faced with having to sell themselves and uh, stalking a very slim number of jobs that were available. Interestingly, and, and I had never made this connection before, but uh, uh, I, I came across this connection that this was about the same time that the Survivor series, which is now what, 43 seasons old, it came into popular. It took over our televisions. Everybody was tuning in to the Survivor series. And after 42 seasons, you know the plot, right? There's a select group of individuals. They're plotted against each other, each one competing for a million dollars U.S. Uh, prize that belongs to the sole survivor. And to stay in the game, each individual has to pull their own weight in a test of uh, physical abilities, whether it's uh, and some of those. But at the same time, they're also uh, pulling strings. They're forming uh, secret alliances. They're double-crossing. They're just undermining the status of all the other would-be survivors. And ultimately, let's face it, ultimately the one who wins is the most self-directed, self-motivated, self-absorbed, self-important individual. That's the final survivor. And so they talk today about a survivor mentality. What is a survivor mentality? A survivor mentality is looking out for yourself. <coughs> A survival mentality is you only cooperate when your own interests can be advanced. And anyone who cannot help you is not to be bothered with. It's not anyone who cannot help you is, is not worth your time. And you need to sleep with one eye open because when everyone is out for her, herself or himself, you cannot trust anybody. And because nobody can be trusted, you can't be real or honest with other people. And so get used to being lonely. 
And finally, a survivor mentality, a survivor world is win-lose. Only one can win. Only one can take home the prize. And the others, they're cast off, right? What a different world the gospel offers. The gospel is not about survivorhood. It's about servanthood. The gospel is not about manipulating others to serve our selfish interests. The gospel is about, as Paul puts it in this fifth chapter of Galatians, it's about serving one another humbly in love. It is about faith expressing itself through love. There's a story told about uh, Albert Einstein, and it's said that Albert Einstein, for most of his life, he had two uh, portraits hanging in his, uh, on his wall as, ro as role models. Uh, these were two uh, uh, important scientists, I Sir Isaac Newton and uh, James Maxwell. And uh, I had to look up what James Maxwell was famous for, but, but something to do with uh, electromagnet fields or something. Anyways, he had these two portraits, Isaac Newton and James Maxwell hanging on his wall. They were the role models Albert Einstein uh, had to inspire him. But interestingly, near the end of his life, Einstein took these portraits down and he replaced them with portraits of Albert Schweitzer and Mahatma Gandhi. And these were two um, individuals that were uh, in pursuit of... of uh, of something higher. Einstein said the reason that he switched these portraits out was that he needed, he realized that he needed new role models. He needed model role models not of success, but he needed role models of humble service. And I think in the fifth chapter of Galatians, that's what Paul is trying to show us, trying to paint for us. Paul is trying to get us to see some new portraits, some different portraits, some new models of behavior. And the point that he's been driving home in the first four chapters that we have looked at over the past uh, month or so is that, you know, as, as great as the law of Moses was, as great as the law of Moses has been, the Galatians now have a different model. They have the ultimate model for God-centered living. And it's not in the law. The model now to hang on the wall is not the Ten Commandments. The model now to hang on the wall is that of Jesus Christ himself. And there have been some uh, interlopers that have come through Galatia, and they've been telling those believers, especially the believers, the Christians in Galatia that weren't of Jewish heritage, that they needed to become part of the family of Abraham. And they needed to do that through some fleshly obedience. They needed to do that through circumcision. And Paul is saying, no, no, you have the inward guidance of the Holy Spirit. You, all of you Galatians, just like me, Paul says, we've received the Spirit. And the Spirit makes Christ real in our lives. And that is a superior model for a community of believers. And the Galatians know. The Galatians know this. They know that they have already received the Spirit, even though Paul reminds them of that a couple of times in this letter. But Paul's point is, okay, you understand that, but now you have to learn what that means. Now you have to put into practice what the Spirit has been given to you for. It's just not, the Spirit's not just given to you so you can say, I have the Spirit. The Spirit has been given to you to produce something. Specifically, it's been given to you to produce a community, a group of believers who are united and who are energized by the Messiah's own example of love, of cross-shaped or cruciform-shaped love. And so instead of being constrained by obedience to the law, Paul says that, Galatian, that the Galatians and Christians are called to nothing less 
than full freedom in Christ. And so that's, those are the first words in the fifth chapter. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Instead of the old conflict-filled ways of the flesh that were celebrated uh, for some of the Galatians that came from a background other than the Jewish faith, they have these pagan rites, these rituals, um, and Paul says the greatest thing, the greatest fruit of the Spirit is Christian love. And it's great because Christian love knits us together. It knits us together so tight that it is like we are slaves to one another. Now, some translations try to tone this down a bit. And your translation may say that through love we become servants to one another. And I think in generally in our English language, servant is a little step above. We think of the English butler, right? A servant. Oh, it would be nice to have a servant, wouldn't it, Pat? But actually the word is slave. <coughs> slave. And Paul himself in the opening verses of Galatians says that he was a, and again our translations um, uh, um, cover this up a bit or make it sound a little better, Paul says I, that he was a slave of Christ. You think of the connotations of slavery even in our day. We, when we hear the word slavery, we think of the U.S. experience of slavery. It's not a very positive picture. But even in Paul's day, slavery, to be a slave, you had no, you were a piece of property to be used and abused. And so to say that you are a slave, now Paul says, I'm a slave of Christ. And to say that we are slaves to one another. And so at the very moment that Paul introduces this talk about freedom, and we all get excited about that word. We've heard a lot about it in the last little while, right? Freedom. At the very moment he says freedom, he paints this picture of a slave, of a servant. So the first thing we need to understand is that for Paul, Freedom is not maybe what we think when we hear that word. The only true freedom is to be had in Christ. Freedom in Christ. Freedom that comes with the presence of God's Spirit in our life. And so Paul, who identifies, as I've mentioned, he identifies himself in chapter 1, verse 10, as a slave of Christ. He knows that freedom, Christian freedom, freedom in Christ is not freedom to sin. It's freedom from sin. It's not freedom from others. It's freedom to serve others. Slaves of Christ are men and women who are free to, to be selfless. They are free to... Um, to love others more than themselves. They are uh, free to give, free to think of others before themselves. And this is where, as Christians, we find our greatest freedom, our greatest power, our greatest successes. Survivor mentality says that the two alternatives that get you to the end are the survival of the fittest. And survival of the fittest is survivalship through self-serving schemes, through thinking about yourself first and foremost. What's the scene of the slogan? Outwit, outplay outlast. Me, me, and me. Now, we may say, well, you know, I, I really, uh, I'm not, 
I don't actively work to undermine somebody else's success. I'm not trying to block somebody else's uh, path to, to achieving, uh, to achievement. And we may not do that actively, but we also need to think about how we might passively, maybe through ambivalence, maybe through apathy, maybe we allow the survival of the fittest mentality to reign in our world, in our lives. But when we're free from needing to emphasize who we are, to use Paul's language, according to the flesh, who we are according to the standards of our world, then the motivation and the power of the Spirit frees us in Christ, frees us for God, to serve God, and it frees us to love our neighbors. And that's the double freedom, the double freedom that is made possible by God through his Spirit. And as the fruit of the Spirit demonstrates, and this is the chapter, Galatians 5, where we get that list of the fruit of the Spirit, as the fruit of the Spirit demonstrates, we are free, we're free to be led by the Spirit into a new way of life. And Paul talks about keeping in step with the Spirit. And what he means by that, or walking in the Spirit, what he means by that is we need to give attention. We need to give attention to what does the Spirit want to produce in our lives. And we need to reflect on that. We need to reflect on how on what the Spirit wants to produce in our lives. How, how would that come about? You think of the fruit of the Spirit, goodness, peace, love, faithfulness, joy. How, how can the Spirit produce that? How might that be in my life? How could that come about? How can I let the Spirit's influence in my life be felt in a complete way? I don't know if that's significant or not, that it advanced automatically, but anyways, I, I'm not finished here yet. Because I want to point out something, oftentimes, because in our Western culture, we think as individuals mo almost all of the time. And so oftentimes when we come to a list like this, the fruit of the Spirit, we're thinking in terms of individuals. This is what, this is for me, for me. But Paul's exhortation here is not to private individual Christians. He is writing to a group of believers. He is writing to the Galatian communities, these Galatian churches, these communities in Christ. And he is saying to them, as a church, as a community, as a whole, this is the fruit that you as a church, as a group of believers, need to grow. Life in the Spirit is not about personal, is not limited to personal morality. It is worked out on the public stage. It is worked out in our community. And it is, as we learn to live and, and, and uh, live by new values and, and, and different norms, and just think about these items that are listed as fruit of the Spirit. They are not really individual virtues. These are social qualities. These are social qualities that enhance and maintain a community. You cannot do love, peace, patience, faithfulness, Job, just go through the list. You cannot do all of these by yourself. Even self-control is not just about you. These are fruit for the community. Contrast that with the acts or the works of the flesh that Paul lists just before the fruit. And these are all really looking inward. 
These are all about me in contrast to the fruit of the Spirit. And so cultivating and growing the Spirit's fruit is a team effort. It is something that happens in our life together as people of God. And together we want to grow and cultivate that fruit and spur and encourage each other to grow that fruit. And when the qualities appear with all of their rich contribution to the sort of community that God intends and and God will eventually produce, then they come and they're like fruit in an orchard. I was thinking about if I was a nursery owner and I was trying to figure out the best way to sell peach trees, how would I go about it? I could uh, get together a bunch of uh, very beautiful leafy, we don't have any peach trees here in all our tree collection, uh, leafy uh, saplings, and I could create a beautiful display and maybe at the entrance to my nursery. And, uh, or maybe I could just come up with a colorful catalog with pictures like this uh, that have peach trees and, and all their various stages of growth. Maybe that would sell it. But maybe there's something else that would really sell a peach tree. And maybe what really could sell the peach tree was if I could come up with a peach. And, you know, just what a peach produces, that sweet smell, that unique color of a peach, the fuzzy skin. I'd buy that. I did buy that. The best way to sell a peach tree, pluck that ripe peach, cut it open, let the juice dribble down your arm, and then hand a slice to a customer. And when they taste the fruit, they want the tree. Think about a community that behaves like this. Think about a community that is like that, both among themselves and with outsiders. They're like a peach tree filled with those juicy, sweet-smelling peaches. And like the bright peaches that are standing out against the green leaves of a tree, the fruit of the Spirit announces to a starving world, here is food, here is life. Come and find a way out of your exhaustion. Come and find a way out of your, discour- your, your discouragement. Come and meet God. And that fruit-filled community will be attractive, even if people can't quite figure out what's going on. In Galatia, there was a lot of strife among those in the church. And it was, if we can pick up from Paul's, what he's writing to them about, it's because they had surrendered their lives to the flesh in the name of freedom. They were exercising freedom, all right, freedom to do what they wanted, and they had begun to devour one another personally in their desire for power and control. And Paul enters into this battle And he gives the Galatians a message and a letter that still has impact today. And it's a message that when God's people live in the free spirit, they don't war with one another. Rather, they bring glory to God. And they bring glory to God who wants us to enjoy the fellowship that God promises And that comes from 
the Spirit. Those who are free in Christ and through the Spirit are set to free, are set free to serve God. They're set free to follow Jesus. They're set free to live in the Spirit. And so the Spirit animates our lives before God. So we can be and do what God wants us to do, what God wants us to be. As Christians individually, we become free. But we don't become free just so we can be me. We become free so that we might become a part of a community. Christian freedom is freedom that seeks fellowship, not isolation. A lot of people think, seek freedom so they can get away from it all. Christian freedom seeks fellowship. Christian freedom is not personal absorption. It's not ego-focused. Christian freedom is freedom for something, not from something. It is freedom for relating to God, freedom to relate to self, and freedom to relate to one another. And Christians who are free in Christ's spirit find their fulfillment in the freedom of service. The freedom that comes through Christ frees us to every possibility and every potential in our efforts to demonstrate the love of Christ to others. We're free to demonstrate the love of Christ to others. Somebody has said that freedom in Christ is God's gift for neighbor love. And in fact, in this chapter, Galatians chapter 5, if you get a chance to read through it, you will see that Paul talks about uh, the, the greatest commandments include love your neighbor as yourself. Paul's whole message in Galatians can be summarized, I think, in one sentence. All six chapters. Be free. Be free. Be free through Christ. Be free in God's spirit. And when we come to God through Christ, when we come to God as recipients of his spirit, we are more than survivors. We are free, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last.